O Lord, who for our sake did fast 40 days and 40 nights, give us self-control like that, that our flesh may be ever subdued to your spirit and your word towards true holiness and righteousness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We're in Dr. Millard Erickson's Christian Theology, uh, Chapter 3, Method of Theology. Uh, the theological scene today, the process of doing theology, collection of biblical materials, unification of biblical materials, analysis of the meaning of biblical teachings, examination of historical documents, identification of the essence of the doctrine, illumination of the sources beyond the Bible, contemporary expression of the doctrine, development of the central interpretive motif, stratification of the topics, degrees of authority of theological statements. We'll notice so far we've seen nothing about the confessions or the uh, or the creeds or liturgical documents were on our alert since we're confessional and prayer people. We believe the reform documents in the prayer book is past substantial biblical muster, the superior adjudicative forum. So we go on. Theological scene today, the doing of theology, like all other human endeavors, takes place within a given context. Each theologian and student of theology lives a specific period of time rather than in some timeless vacuum. Theology must be done within that situation. Is he relativizing? We appreciate the point, but there are timeless statements here, are there not? There are both theological and non-theological factors in every situation. Before we proceed, it is important for us to observe certain characteristics of the present-day theological scene. The first theological factor that is significant and to some what some extent unique about the present period is for the tendency for theologies to have brief lifespans. <laughs> There's been progressively developing trend. In earlier times, a given form of theology might persist for decades or even centuries, but that seems to have changed. In the 5th century, Augustine developed a synthesis of Platonic philosophy and theology, the city of God, which in many ways dominated theology for more than 800 years. And Thomas Aquinas synthesized Catholic theology with Aristotle's philosophy, Summa Theologica, and thus supplied a basis until the Reformation, the interval being nearly 300 years years, three centuries. The former has developed a system of theology independent of the earlier Catholic syntheses with Calvin's Institute of the Christian Religion. Mm -hmm. Being the most thorough statement of the new understanding of Christianity, although there were heretical movements from time to time, and a somewhat different understanding of evangelical Theology came into being with the work of John Wesley. For a period of more than 250 years, there was no major theological figure or writing to rival the influence of Calvin. Then, with the work of Friedrich Schleiermacher, came the birth of liberal theology. It's misnamed not as an outside challenge to orthodoxy as deism had been, but as a competitor within the church, Schleiermacher's own religion, speeches to culture despisers, and his Christian faith were the first indications of a new theology was abroad. Liberalism with its different varieties was to dominate European theology throughout the 19th century and into the early 20th century. <clears throat> 
the period of popularity being somewhat later in America. If the 19th century ended in 1914 for Karl Barth, it was in 1919 that this change became apparent to the rest of the theological world. That change became apparent with his publication of their Roma brief, Epistle to the Romans. And I've heard this so many times, and that, that volume was not very... I wasn't impressed with it. But they called it the bombshell. This marked the end of liberal theology and the ascendancy of what came to be known as neo-orthodoxy. The duration of its su supremacy proved notably shorter, however, than that of some of the preceding theologies. Rudolf Bultmann's New Testament mythology heralded the beginning of a movement, or actually program, known as demythologization. This was to prove a short-lived and yet genuine displacement of the neo-orthodox view. In 1954, Ernst Kostner presented a paper which marked the resurgence in the search for the historical Jesus, calling into question the view of Boltman. Yet this did not really introduce the new system. It primarily indicated the end of the regnant systems as such. Note what has been occurring during this period. The first great theological systems which we observed lasted for hundreds of years, but the period of dominance of each was shorter than that of its immediate predecessor. The lifespan theologies is becoming shorter and shorter. Thus, any theology which attempts to tie itself too closely to the present conditions in the intellectual world is evidently consigned to early obsolescence. This is particularly obvious in the case of the death of God theology, which flourished briefly as far as public attention was concerned in the 1960s and then faded from sight almost as quickly as it come to life. In the terminology of the present day, the half-life of new theologies is very short indeed, thankfully. Number two, another phenomenon of the present is the demise of the great schools of theology as such. By this we do not mean educational institutions, but definite clusterings, movements of adherence around a given set of teachings. Today they are merely individual theologies and theologians. While this is not completely true, there is nonetheless a considerable element of correctness in the generalization. When I began doctoral studies in theology in 1959, it was fairly easy to classify theologians into camps or teams. There were the orthodox team, the neo-orthodox, the neoliberals, the demythologizers, and other groups. Here and there, individuals such as Paul Tillich defied classification, falling outside of every other particular group. Catholic theology was considered, at least by those outside of it, to be rather monolithic. All Catholic theologians were Thomists. Today, matters are quite different. To use an athletic metaphor, whereas previously the playing field was occupied by several teams, easily distinguished by their uniforms. Now each player seems to wear a different uniform. There are, to be sure, specific theologies, for example, the theology of hope and process theology, that these lack internal coherence and a complete set of doctrines traditionally manifested by theological systems built on an overall theme or even mood. Movements such as the theology of liberation, black theology, feminist theology, or various secular theologies are simply orientations on some set of sociological concerns. None of these really deserves to be termed a theological system. What all this means is that it is no longer possible to adopt 
one's theology by buying into a system. Whereas in earlier times, there were distinctive theologies which had worked their view out virtually on every topic. One could therefore find consistent answers to each question by buying into a system. This is no longer the case. <clears throat> They're only sketches rather than detailed blueprints of theology. Number three, related to these other developments is the fact that there do not seem to be theological giants that were abroad even a generation ago. In the first half of the 20th century, there were great theological thinkers who formulated extensive, carefully crafted systems of theology. Karl Barth, Emil Brunner, Paul Tillich, Rudolf Bultmann, even in conservative circles like G.C. Burkauer in the Netherlands and Edward Cornell and Carl Henry in the United States were recognized as leaders. Now most of these men have passed from the active theological think scene and no thinkers have arisen to dominate the theological landscape quite as well as they did. Two have made noteworthy accomplishments such as Wolfhart Pannenberg and Jürgen Moltmann but they have not gathered sizable followings. Consequently, there's a considerable larger circle of influential theologians, but the extent of influence exerted by any one of them is less than that of the men already mentioned. Theology is now being done in a period characterized by, among other things, a knowledge explosion. The amount of information is growing so rapidly mastery of a large area of thought is becoming increasingly difficult. While this is especially true in technological areas, biblical and theological knowledge is also much broader than it once was. The result has been a much greater degree of specialization than was previously the case. In biblical studies, for example, New Testament scholars tend to specialize in the Gospels or Pauline writings. Church historians who tend to specialize in one period, such as the Reformation. Consequently, research and publication are often narrower areas in greater depth. This means that the systematic theologian will find it increasingly difficult to cover the entire range of doctrines to do all of theology in depth as Karl Barth sought to do in his mass of church dogmatics for example becomes the task of a light lifetime Barth himself died before completing his work systematic theology is further complicated by the fact that it requires a knowledge of all scripture and of the developments of the thoughts through the history of the church. Moreover, as new information is concerned, systematic theology is not restricted to recent discoveries in the field of biblical and Hebrew philology, for example, it must also relate to modern developments in such secular areas as sociology, biology, and other disciplines. Yet the task must be done at various levels, including the elementary and introductory. Recent decades saw the development of an intellectual atmosphere which was rather unfavorable to the doing of systematic theology. In part, this was the result of an atomistic approach to knowledge, awareness, of the vast amounts of detail to be produced, produced the feeling that bits and pieces of data could not be effectively gathered into any sort of inclusive whole. It was considered impossible for anyone to have an overview of the entire field of systematic theology. Another factor impeding systematic theology was the view of revelation of historical events. According to this view, revelation was always given, given in concrete historical settings. 
Hence, what was revealed was limited to that localized perspective. The message dealt with specifics rather than the universal statements about things in general. Sometimes there was a tendency to believe that this diversity of particulars could not be combined into any sort of harmonious whole. Thus, it should be noted, it was based upon implicit assumption that reality is internally incoherent. Consequently, any attempt to harmonize or systematize would inevitably be distortive of the reality under consideration. The result of all this was that biblical theology was thought to be adequate and systematic theology dispensable. In effect, biblical theology was substituted for systematic theology. This had two effects. First, it meant that theology written and studied had a more limited scope. It was now possible to concentrate upon Paul's anthropology or Matthew's Christology. This was much more manageable endeavor than attempting to see what the entire Bible had to say on these subjects. The second effect was theology became descriptive rather than normative. The question was no longer what do you believe about sin, but what do you believe Paul taught about sin? The views of Luke, Isaiah, and other biblical writers who mention sin might then in turn be described, particularly where there was thought to be tension between these views. During those years, systematic theology was in retreat. It was engaged in an introspective concern about its own nature. Was it in fact justified? How could it be carried out? Relatively little was being done in terms of a comprehensive overall treatments of theology. Essays on particular topics of theology were being written but not the system building that had traditionally characterized the discipline. Now, however, that is changing. Several new systematic theology textbooks have appeared and others are in preparation. For example, Gordon Kaufman's Systematic Theology, a historicist perspective, John McQuarrie, Principles of Christian Theology, Donald Blesch, Essentials of Evangelical Theology, Dale Moody's Word of Truth, Summary of Christian Doctrine, these are all set 60s and 70s. <clears throat> now it is biblical theology, which far from replacing systematic theology, is being re-examined re as to its viability. As one rather prophetic treatment of biblical theology, in effect, argues that it must be moved forward to becoming more like systematic theology, as Brevard Childs in Biblical Theology in Crisis indicates. There are indications of a swing away from the emphasis upon immediate experience, which contributed to the reaction against systematic theology, the growth of cults and foreign religions some of them extreme in their control of their devotees and in practices which they engage, has reminded us that the reflective and critical element in religion is indispensable. And there's been a growing awareness, partly through the rise of the new hermeneutic, that is, that it is not possible to form a theology simply on the basis of the Bible. Issues such as how the Bible is to be conceived of and approached in interpretation must be dealt with. And one is therefore plunged into the much larger realm of issues traditionally dealt with in systematic theology. One of the lessons which we might well learn from the foregoing brief survey of the recent and present status of the theological milieu is to beware of two close and identification with any current mood and culture.
Well, yeah, kind of think so. How about the, the Bible control and the mode? Let's see where he goes. The rapid changes in theology are but a rapid but reflection of the rapid changes in culture in general. The times of such rapid change, it is probably wise not to attempt too close a fit between the theology and the world in which it is expressed. While we will discuss in chapter 5, we're in 3 now, the matter of contemporizing the Christian message, it is perhaps wise at the present time to take a step back towards the timeless form of Christian truth and away from an ultra-contemporary statement of it, you think? Two analogies come to mind, one from athletics, the other from mechanics. The defensive back in football, in football, or the player on defense in basketball must be careful not to play an extremely quick offensive player too closely. If he does, he may find that his opponent is past him and he's unable to recover quickly enough. To avoid the danger of a big gain or an easy score, he must risk the chance of his opponents catching a short pass or getting off a long shot. Similarly, it is well not to have too much looseness in a mechanical device, since this would lead to excessive wear. If the mechanism is tightened too severely, there may not be enough play to allow for the normal movement of parts, and they may snap. The theology to be developed within this writing will seek to strike something of a balance between the timeless elements and essence of the doctrines and a statement of them geared to a contemporary audience. We're having some problems here. Let's see how he handles it. To the extent that it concentrates on the former, it will make the elements found within the Bible normative for the basic structure. Thank you. In this connection, it should be pointed out that the orthodox form of theology is not the theology of any one period, not even a fairly recent one. This latter erroneous conception seems to underline Reverend Child's characterization of Louis Burkhoff's systematic theology as a repristination of 17th century dogmatics. A repristination. The sum, this present work may appear to be the same. To be sure, the incorporation or repetition. I'm glad Brevard Childs at least read Louis Burkhoff. Maybe one of the finest one hand, one volume systematic theologies on the market. I started reading that as a young man, age 18. I read it numerous times. It's just Marvelous. <laughs> Brevard, come on now. To be sure, the incorporation or repetition of 17th century statements of orthodox theology may justify a criticism of that type. But a theology should not be assessed as being nothing but a version of an earlier theology simply because it happens to agree with the theology of an earlier time. Rather, the two theologies may be differing versions of the traditional Christian position. In the preface, we alluded to a remark by Cursop Lake. It is a mistake often made by educated persons who happen to have but little knowledge of historical theology. Well, this is a famous statement. 1926, Religion of Yesterday and Tomorrow. To suppose that fundamentalism is a new and strange form of thought, it is nothing of the kind. It is the partial and uneducated survival of the theology which was once universally held by all Christians. How many were there, for instance, in Christian churches in the 18th century who doubted the infallible inspiration? scripture. A few perhaps, but very few. 
No, the fundamentalist may be wrong. I think that he is. But it is we who have departed from the tradition, not he. And I am sorry for anyone who tries to argue with a fundamentalist on the basis of authority. The Bible and the corpus theologicum of the church are on the fundamentalist's side. Glad to reread that. And not just have it fundamentalists, but confessional Presbyterians, confessional Anglicans, and so forth. It's the liberals who've left the faith. And Chris, University of Chicago, I think, as a historian, sees that. A liberal, well, no, that's a long word, uh, dogmatically egocentric, hubristic, and uneducated. Well, not an educated, an educated uh, unbeliever. That's that that'll work. Second lesson which we may learn from our survey of the present theological scene is that a degree of eclecticism is both possible and desirable. This is not to suggest the incorporation of ideas from a wide variety of perspectives. Rather, it is to note that today issues are generally being treated more or less on strongly ideological basis. As a result, distinctive systems are not as readily produced. We need to keep our doctrinal formulations flexible enough to be able to recognize and utilize valid insights from positions which we, with which we in general disagree while we are to systematize or integrate the biblical data, we ought not to do so from too narrow a basis. A third reason to be derived from the present situation is the importance of maintaining a degree of independence in one's approach to doing theology. When one theologian is a giant, there is a tendency to simply adopt his treatment of a particular doctrine. There is a feeling that there is no way one can improve on it. This was, for example, the feeling that Jürgen Moltmann had after reading Karl Barth's dogmatics. Barth had said everything, so there was nothing left to say. But one, one becomes unreservedly committed to another person's perspective of thought. He becomes a disciple in the worst sense of that term, merely repeating what he has learned from the master. Creative and critical thinking ceases. But the fact that there are no undisputed superstars, or at least very few of them, should spur us to both being critical of the teaching of anyone whom we read and hear, and willing to modify it at any point where we think we can improve upon it so much for that, that was uh, the section of uh, the theological scene today very interesting the process of doing theology we now turn to the actual task of developing a theology there's a sense in which theology is an art as well as a science so that it cannot follow a rigid structure Yet procedures need to be spelled out. The following steps will not necessarily be followed in this sequence, but there must be a comparable logical order of development. The reader will notice that in this procedure, biblical theology, in both the true and pure sense, is developed before systematic theology, so that the sequence is exegesis, biblical theology, systematic theology. We do not move directly from exegesis to systematic theology. And here we are called this at this juncture as well. Glory be to the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.